Hey everybody, today I'm going to be reviewing Jennifer's Body. This film came out in 2009, it was directed by Karen Kasama. So I'm reviewing this with Halloween obviously in mind, and I know it's not really a horror film in the classic sense, it's more like a, a comedy, a horridy, whatever you want to call it, and I do remember when this movie came out, and I swear to you at the time, it, it really did not do well, but I remember thinking that it is going to find an audience at some point. It's going to be a cult movie. I think I just, I saw what Diablo Cody was going for and I don't think people quite got it at the time. And I remember thinking 10 years from now, I'll bet you more people are going to ask Diablo Cody, the writer of Jennifer's Body, more people are going to ask her about that than uh, her previous Oscar winning work, uh, Juno. And from what I have observed, that seems to be true both for Diablo Cody and Megan Fox. And I think that's just really, really awesome. Just cause like I said, I've been in this movie's corner for many years. I think if this movie came out today it would do really well. I think it would actually be a major hit just because obviously today we're leaning more towards that more like academic postmodern very meta horror type of style when it comes to our movies compared to what we were doing more in the mid 2000s. I just think the leaning towards like pro-female horror pro-LGBTQ type of horror is obviously a lot more um, marketable these days than it might have been back then. Back then it, obviously they really struggled to market it and I could see that at the time I think people just wanted to see uh, Megan Fox and Amanda Seyfried uh, make out. They didn't want to see all this like academic postmodern horridy camp. And watching Jennifer's Body again for this review, I, I have to say I really, really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it more than I thought I would. And it's just great. This movie really does have legs. I really think it grows uh, stronger through the years. The humor, humor just felt darker and more pungent, I think, than usual. And it felt more cinematic than I remembered. And the whole film has this kind of dreamy, kind of punk rock energy to it that I just really, really enjoy. It reminds me of like a like a Sleigh Bells album, as an example. Sleigh Bells the band, not like Christmas. And the writing in this movie, I think, is some of the best uh, Diablo Cody has ever done. Now, I'm not saying I have seen everything that she's done. And, uh, you know, like I, I've actually been quite critical of her work over the years. And yet I have always enjoyed her sense of humor, despite the flaws. And I think just here, it comes alive with just this wicked charm. Uh, there's a confidence here that I think she didn't have maybe necessarily with Juno. She, she knew what she wanted. I think this is one of those things that she probably envisioned when she was maybe a teenager or something. She knows she's going fully for that kind of postmodern kind of 70s art house cult horridy type of vibe that I'm mentioning. It's got a lot of Carrie vibes. Obviously that's one of my favorite horror movies of all time. It has Dario Argento vibes for sure. It's obviously got Ginger Snaps vibes. Um, and yeah, even so, it still is very much alive with Diablo's spirit. For me in this movie, there's just something very tart about the dialogue. It feels like hard candy or something. And there's something rough around the edges about it. And yet I really respond to it. And she's really going dark here. And I think that Cody is at her best when she's tapping into that dark side. And I think Juno was just a little bit too forced, too cutesy gimmicky for my taste. And this is just, as I said, a lot more confident. It's a lot more just bold and fun. And the humor is, is subversive. And what I do enjoy about the dialogue is how it's kind of finding the sweet spot. It's obviously very self-aware. It always knows that it's working within a particular framework. It's, it's meant to be cheeky, very postmodern in that sense. And yet the dialogue does feel weirdly almost like stuff that you would actually hear teenagers say. Now, maybe in like some weird alternate reality or fantasy, whatever, but I don't know, there's just something about this where it's like, yeah, I could see young people talking like this. And normally when like a director, or I should say a writer, when a writer maybe wins an Oscar for something, they do feel like they have to be very critically acclaimed and, or whatever. And maybe if they write something about kids, uh, the kids might sound more adult than they actually are. And I love that she really stuck to her guns. This one never loses that youthful spirit, but it also really gets that youthful spirit. It has that very, yeah, like mid, 2000s leftover hot topic kind of alternative emo sort of thing going on there. And the lines are just really funny. They're really sardonic. And I found myself laughing out loud more than I think I ever have. And maybe that's just because I forgot a lot of the dialogue. It's been a while since I had seen the movie, but I was just really surprised at how far that they were willing to push that sar sarcastic tone. I will say if there's one thing that I do have a complaint about is so far as the self-awareness is concerned in the movie, it does maybe deflate the tension a little bit. And I do have that complaint about a lot of like postmodern style uh, movies, but um, it also creates another layer of intrigue for me in a different way because the humor is not only meant to be meta and playful, um, but you know that sarcasm is meant to be kind of dark, obviously, and it's meant to 
kind of prove itself to become a defense mechanism for certain characters. And so that humor, even though it's meant to be very biting and you know have a certain edge to it, it's meant to also be uh, very tragic so far as its function. And I think maybe that's part of why I really gravitate towards this movie because I like movies that show humor as a defense mechanism. And then they sh show how that unravels um, as the movie goes. And I also love stories that explore, I should say subvert, uh, the idea behind the uh, the pretty girl, the pretty girl persona. I always have, and I don't know why, I think part of it is because movies are such a voyeuristic experience. I think that the, the pretty girl trope is just maybe dismissed often. It's really hard to get beyond beauty in the first place, and that's part of it, I think. But I think they do a really good job with the Jennifer character here, because, you know, they're not delving deeply into her psychology or anything like that. But still, I see her as a, a very tragic figure, and uh, I love just the image of her hovering in that like blood-stained white dress. I feel a kind of a similar twinge of pain for her in that moment that I, like I do for Carrie, you know, maybe when she uh, is walking out of the school and it's burning and she's in her own blood-splattered dress. And Jennifer is, like I said, you know, she's the bad girl trope, but subverted. She is classically beautiful and she has always her whole life been the center of attention to the point where she doesn't know how to not be. But with that attention comes a major objectification and insecurity that kind of forms because of that. And therefore she's very lost in her life. And uh, her defense mechanism for that reason is sex. Um, and it's also her weapon in life. And her best friend Needy, played by Amanda Seyfried, is the nerdy girl and she's far less sexy and Jennifer loves that. She wants her to remain less sexy forever because uh, Jennifer is the one who must be the most desired. She has to be the center of attention, but why is that? It gives her a sense of control, but it also gives her a sense of distance because she's very untouchable in her beauty and yet needy is somebody that is approachable and that is a big contradiction. But the fact that they add this element of, you know, Jennifer being alone at the top and she secretly you know, has feelings perhaps for Needy, but uh, I like that they write Needy as a, as a happy character. She has a boyfriend that she's clearly very in love with, and um, she doesn't need to be the most beautiful person in the room to be fulfilled in that way. And the idea of devouring boys so that it keeps you young and beautiful, uh, as well as the sexual metaphor of exploration, particularly here, you know, so far as adolescents are concerned, I think it's the perfect way to bring Jennifer's conflict to life. And we have to remember too that Jennifer is a victim of sexual assault, perhaps in the past, but it's, it's certainly uh, evident in the movie as well. And that aspect of her defensiveness, I think, is the true tragedy of her character and the true tragedy, uh, I think, of the beautiful woman often enough. But again, it never tries to make her some deeply sympathetic, you know, character. Thank God. She is the antagonist. She is fully the villain here, um, but she's treated with a sense of respect and admiration, I think, by the writer. Adding even just like just the little scenes, like the scene um, where she's getting ready for the party and, and she's she's putting on her makeup and she's, she's crying, you know, at the same time is obviously a cliche image that we see in a lot of movies. And yet, I think when it works, it really works well. And there, I thought it was very effective at getting across what it needed to. There's kind of like an enchanting quality to the movie. It almost has like a, a dark fairy tale sort of feeling to it, which I also think is very cool. Um, I, I like the ending a lot to the movie. I liked it more, I think, this uh, most recent time than I ever had before. This metaphor for sacrifice and Jennifer obviously gaining these powers, it obviously does destroy her. And by gaining those powers, obviously it means there is a loss of innocence, which is painful, I think, in its own way. Obviously there's a, a destructive element to it as well. And yet at the same time, Needy is able to take ownership of those powers in a way, use it for revenge. Her taking ownership over her identity rather than the other way around, losing herself to it like Jennifer, I think is the ultimate redemption in the movie. And yeah, it's just, it's a really pleasant little movie. Now, are there times that I wish that the movie were more cinematic? Sure. Do I wish this movie were more like Carrie in its style? Hell yeah, I do. I, I wish that there was a really, really great director that could have done something really, really amazing with this. I think it would just help create more of like a full bodied experience, maybe help the tension a little bit more, like I mentioned at the beginning of the review. You can marry some of the horror elements and the humor elements together where they are slightly more committed, I think, aesthetically, but for what it is, 
I think this is a really fantastic movie and I'm really, really glad to see that it's found an audience. So yeah, I do recommend this just as a fun movie to watch sometime, you know, for Halloween this October. But yeah, that is my review. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm going to plug my website as always. It is deepfocuslens.com. I'm an artist. I do commission portraits and I sell prints of my work. If that is something that you're interested in, you can always go to the website below. And if you have a question about a commission or a print, you can email me. My email is in the description box below as well. Also, I'd like to give a shout out to my patrons who are fantastic guys thank you so much for your support if you are interested in supporting the link for that is below as well as the rest of my social media information you can watch more videos here and you can subscribe if you'd like catch you next time